Hello everybody, good afternoon. My name is Axel Wieder, I'm director of Bergen Kunsthalle and I'm uh, very happy to welcome you all to tonight's, today's uh, platform talk uh, with Keller Easterling um, speaking about medium design. Platform is uh, Bergen Kunsthalle's own uh, series of uh, talks that often happen in connection to larger projects we're organizing and we're very happy to welcome today uh, Keller here for this um, presentation and we're very happy that uh, we actually have a very full house um, and I hope everybody found uh, a comfortable seat. Um, uh, this talk takes place in the context of our current exhibition uh, on circulation which uh, runs until tomorrow and which looks at, uh, the, at distribution and networks as a central paradigm of contemporary society and its reflection in and uh, the impact on the work of um, artists. Uh, and today's talk is uh, the last one in a series, in an extensive series of uh, talks that happened um, in the context of this exhibition and which looked at different aspects uh, of this topic. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Kelly here today with us because uh, her book, uh, Extra Statecraft, the Power of Infrastructure Space, which was published in 2014, was really like a crucial um, piece of uh, research for us uh, in the process of uh, making this exhibition. Uh, the book uh, looks at the key term of infrastructure and um, clarifies or investigates uh, the material conditions for networks and what seems usually uh, rather immaterial if you speak about the logic of um, how society in space is organized today. And in the exhibition this plays out in various examples or um, pieces of investigation of um, production lines, travel routes, trading routes, laws and policies, for example in the um, in a film by Baudel Fou looking at uh, the Code Minier and um, the way in which uh, this piece of legislation uh, regulates um, extraction of uh, minerals in uh, the Congo, but also the material infrastructure of data networks, for example. An important example for me of uh, thinking about infrastructures uh, is, an, is a bit of an older example. Uh, coming from Germany in Berlin, for example, um, uh, there has been uh, quite significant research into how um, the sewer system as an infrastructure uh, structured the city even after the Second World War uh, in a quite um, uh, destroyed state, how the sewer system inscribed a kind of logic of uh, the parcellation and uh, in fact also uh, private property in this uh, respect into the um, urban landscape of Berlin. And then your example would be uh, data networks or glass fiber cables and how these uh, structure certain or privilege certain hubs, uh, financial centers in London or uh, in, this in, in the US um, as hubs for uh, high speed uh, trading. Um, Today's talk will, uh, by Keller Easterling will uh, start from uh, a new research that she has been doing, um, speaking about medium design, looking specifically um, into space and how space, even at the moment of digital uh, ubiquity, um, forms a kind of uh, uh, central information system and a broad inclusive mixing chamber for many social, political and technical uh, networks. Um, to sp say a bit about uh, Keller Easterling's background, she's an architect and writer and she's working on the issues of urbanism, architecture and organization in relation uh, to phenomena commonly defined as globalization. Uh, she graduated from Princeton University School of Architecture and has taught architectural design and history at the Parsons, uh, at Parsons the New School of Design, Pratt Institute and Columbia University and she's currently a professor of architecture at Yale University. Her recent publications include the before-mentioned Extra Statecraft, The Power of Infrastructure Space, and Medium Design, about which we'll talk today, but also Substraction from 2014, and an earlier important book, um, Organization Space, Landscapes, Highways, and Houses in America from, from 1999. But it's important for the way that um, Keller Easterling practices um, thinking and uh, writing about architecture, that it's not just taking place in the academic field. She also has published widely in um, magazines um, that uh, uh, speak also to a, a different audience, for example, Volume, Pinup, or um, the art magazine Art Forum, or the online uh, journal Eflux. 
And her research uh, and writing was also included in the 2014 and the 2018 uh, Venice Architectural Biennial. Um, I have a few last technical remarks. First of all, thank, yous, thank you to um, the people organizing, helping to organize uh, today's event, Eva and Maria, and Jonas doing the technical part. Uh, I have to remind everybody that uh, we uh, are live streaming this event. This has an impact on um, the way that we use microphones. So if you have questions afterwards, please uh, make sure that you get a microphone before you ask a question. And then I'm pointing out two cameras, one here in the back and one here on this speaker that uh, film. And uh, please make sure that you're not sitting in uh, these angles if you want to avoid being uh, captured by the live stream. We're planning to speak for roughly um, 50 minutes. Um, the presentation takes about 15 minutes and afterwards we will make sure to have time for uh, questions and answers. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you especially Keller Easterling for making the way to Bergen. for that in, uh, for inviting me and for that invitation and thanks for coming out on this rainy day although I understand it's not unusual um, uh, yes uh, my, my work might be called medium design and and it's a contemplation in medium design that I, I thought might contribute to a conversation about this really great show downstairs on circulation um, you're looking at uh, promotional video for the now infamous Neom, the uh, instant uh, kind of free zone city uh, in, in Saudi Arabia um, that uh, uh, has become controversial. But it's that kind of thing that I'm often looking at. I won't talk about it so much today. I mean, the kind of urban porn that makes these uh, free zone world cities. But, you know, I'm often looking at this kind of material, often um, I always say kind of looking with half-closed eyes at the urban world, focusing not only on uh, buildings with shapes and outlines, but also on the uh, matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are suspended. And in a contemporary experience economy, this world of free zones and, and so on. Uh, that matrix is made up of repeatable spatial formulas or spatial products, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones. And, and these almost infrastructural rules and relationships are not like an infrastructure of pipes and wires under the ground but more like, not, far from hidden, a very visible, enveloping uh, urban medium or spatial technology, something almost like multiple operating systems for the city. And it's a technological matrix that's been arresting for me, not only because of its wild mixtures of violence and candy-colored fairy tales, but because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power, because it's creating de facto forms of polity that are outpacing law, and because it's kind of rapidly 3D printing a new layer of the Earth's crust. But I, I've also been arguing, however unlikely it may seem, uh, that this space lends to our art another relevance and uh, another uh, uh, expanded uh, political and aesthetic capacity. Um, and I'll try to talk about why. But this focus on medium thinking or medium design is a habit of mind that's really ever present. It's practiced in many disciplines. Um, you, know, you, you Medium in this urban context means middle or milieu, not bound by 
associations with communication technologies or you know now even media theorists are returning to elemental understandings of media as surrounding environments of air water fire earth uh, oncologists analyze not only the tumor but uh, chemical fluctuations in the surrounding tissue. Um, many disciplines look to matrix. Still, uh, this kind of medium thinking, you could also say, is under-rehearsed in the face of more dominant cultural habits. And those dominant cultural habits are graphically modeled in the infrastructure space I, I look at. I mean, it's sort of simple observation, but but, but culture's really good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing the relationship between things or the repertoires they enact. It, it privileges declarations, right answers, universals, telos, a quest for elementary particles. Um, it's captivated by circular logics and modernist scripts that celebrate freedom and transcendent newness. You know, narrative arcs that are always bending towards the utopian or dystopian ultimate. And this collective habit of mind that seems to always be looking for the one or the one and only is so often organized like a closed loop. And since the loop um, can't abide any contradictory information, it also lashes out with a binary fight when it's challenged. Uh, favoring succession rather than coexistence. The new right answer must kill the old right answer. So in, in some, you know, you can look back on us as human beings, sort of beautiful soft bodies that are made up of all kinds of iterative errors and so on. Um, but we've, you know, in some kind of fatal error, trained our mind to want to be right. Um, and, and we will all, every single one of us, you know, will go to bed tonight thinking about why we were right all along about um, something. And the binaries and, and chess-beating sovereignty of nations remain in place as the darlings of history. Homo economicus is allowed to upstage and so hold forth. Even when we're looking towards the future, we've got only old sci-fi futurologies that, are, that have to be brought out of mothballs. And, and, the, and the whole thing should also burn, you know, sort of build to some revolution or, or apocalyptic burnout. You know, these are the sort of hackneyed plots of our humanities. So this oscillating between loops and binaries, we're just an unnecessarily violent culture that's, that's usually with the loop kind of eliminating the very information that it needs, often banging away with the same tools that are completely inadequate to address perennial problems, contemporary chemistries of power. So a bully is elected, a migration of refugees swells in number, a financial crisis makes properties worth less than nothing, an industrial disaster kills the laborers in that free zone, um, shorelines flood due to global warming, and, and if economic and military engagement or, or new technologies don't provide a solution, or if the consensus surrounding laws and standards or master plans you know, provides no relief, it's as if some, the smartest people in the world uh, can be left standing with hand to brow. And, and dissent, even, also adopting the same binary, exists within its world of enemies and innocents. And since the world's big bullies and, and bulletproof forms of power thrive on this oscillation between loop and binary, it's as if there's nothing to counter them. What do we have? What do we have to counter the, the people like the orange one? You know, only more ways of fighting and being right and providing the, the rancor that nourishes their violence. So you end up wondering, like, how do you drop through a trap door to engage the flip side of these logics when they keep drawing you back in? On that flip side, nothing is new, nothing is right. There are no dramatic manifestos. Maybe there's only a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that's been eclipsed. And since this medium thinking inverts the typical focus 
uh, uh, you know, looking beyond object to matrix or beyond figure to field. Maybe it also disrupts or inverts some habitual approaches to these stubborn problems. So it's a kind of a blind spot that's right in front of us, or it's a, a kind of terra incognita where we've already been. And maybe space, even in particular some of these large socio-technical organizations, repeatable formulas for formatting space all around the world, maybe they're also good to think with um, because, you know, as Rosalind Williams observed, fr from the micro to the macro scale, from institutions to cities, they're, they're so large, the kinds of infrastructures which one sees downstairs, you know, some of them so large that they change the terms of, of place-based political resistance. But that's just one of the shifted perspectives uh, in this space that's everywhere and nowhere. The urb this urban matrix can't really be assessed with a discrete object, as a discrete object with a name or shape or outline. Instead, it, one looks at it for its activities or the disposition in its organization as that unfolds over time in any context, large or small. So designing the medium is managing the potentials or relationships between objects, the activity or disposition that's imminent in their organization. The disposition of an organization makes some things possible and some things impossible, like a growth medium decides what will live or die, um, or like an operating system sets the rules of the game. Um, and maybe on this flip side, you know, medium design just kind of takes a hard pass on the uh, dramatic ultimates and emancipatory futures. Um, maybe even takes on a bit of double entendre as it, as it discovers extra political and aesthetic capacities, maybe even a redoubled territory of operation in latency, indeterminacy, failure, heavy information, discrepancy, and temperament in organizations. You know, looking more closely at latency and indeterminacy, you know, on this flip side, you know, since, since unreasonable politics easily unravels reasonable politics, or at least I can say that coming from the United States, uh, where you know stupidity is our our greatest national resource. Um, <laughs> but 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 since since reasonable ideas easily unravel, uh, since unreasonable ideas easily unravel reasonable ideas, on this flip side, being right is a really bad idea. Um, in medium design, it's just, it's too weak. Uh, it, it doesn't work against uh, gurus and totalitarian bullies and so on. It, maybe culture's spectacular failures, together with some of these underexploited powers of the medium, inspire some alternative ways to register the design imagination, sort of form making in another key or part of speech. Uh, designers, you know, I'm an architect, we're, we're, we're very good at making things with shapes and outlines, and so we should be, but, but medium design is, is less like making a thing and more like having your hands on, on the faders and toggles of organization. It's, it's the design of interdependencies and chemistries, chain reactions, ratchets, benefits from an, an artistic curiosity about um, spatial mixtures or spatial wiring, not just making a single object, but a platform for inflecting a population of objects, or uh, how, how do you set up relative potentials between them? So there's a comfort with those, with that um, change, and, and the disposition of, of dispositions, our space, are not manipulated with right answers, solutions, master plans, but with time-released forms, multipliers, switches, other organs of interplay, uh, with extended temporal dimensions that allow them to unfold and remain in play. 
So, so medium design would then be a lot like playing pool, where knowing one fixed sequence of shots doesn't do you any good. Um, but being able to see a branching network of possibilities allows you to add more information to the table. You know, in pool, you don't, you can't n know that. You can't, as Gilbert Ryle said, in the difference between knowing that and knowing how. You can't know that. You can't know the answer to playing pool. You know how to play pool. You respond to a, a string of changing conditions over time with an organ of interplay. So this habit of mind, you know, may be pretty, pretty bored with, with uh, the rhetorical, um, and ironically, trying to work on problems that are so urgent that they have to, as I was saying before, kind of skip the drama of being right for something a little more practical. So how how do you design an organ of interplay? Um, you know, for instance, uh, usually in design as an architect, you know, you, you, you usually uh, can only add more material or wipe away what was there and add your superior uh, uh, object. But if you're kind of considering an interplay of spatial variables that adjusts an ecology of building, then you can think about ebbs and flows. You can even think about the subtraction of architecture. This is a project which I'm, I'm just going to show you briefly um, it, that talks about the subtraction of architecture in floodplains or distended suburbs. So I, you know, I won't go into detail, but just to it, it just imagines reverse engineering the mortgage that's been a multiplier of sprawl and even global financial um, disaster, and it's just introducing interplay by by simply considering mortgages and groups for their complementary or or counterbalancing attributes. So it's a it's a, a scheme that reduces collective risk. And and anything can be gamed, but this and this inter so this interplay could be dangerous or productive. Um, but the idea of designing in an interplay w would be to give enough temporal dimension to react to changing conditions, or you know, respond to the moment when you've been politically outmaneuvered. So not a solution then, but something that shouldn't always work. And something that, and this sounds, given our reasonable minds, it sounds contradictory, but of course it's not. It's, it's something that's indeterminate to be practical. So, in, and instead of the kind of paradoxical quest for the emancipatory and the free, it's more empowering, more information rich, are situations that get strengthened by interplay, by mutual obligation, checks, balances, offsets, bargains. What would, you know, what would even be the way one would represent these rat ratcheting changes? So, um, you know, you can probably see some of the antecedents here. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, uh, bound by media theorists, although learning from them. But, you know, you can also see Latour, you can see Foucault or Agamben or Gilbert Ryle and their discussions of dispositio, dispositif, disposition, um, is an awareness of the reverberations of aesthetic practices in, in, in culture about which Benjamin or Rancière write. Uh, from J.J. Gibson, there's a sense of the affordances of things. And um, from someone like Bateson, a sense of temperament, even in the interplay between things. Um, but those flooded properties I was just showing you only become available in failure. Uh, they stop being trafficked mortgage products and return to being land in weather. Um, and while in a world of closed loops, organizations usually try to eliminate error and, um, and, and problems, in medium design, you try to do the opposite. You try to multiply problems and use them to leaven and catalyze each other. It's sort of like, uh, I don't know if you know Perando's paradox, this uh, kind of counterintuitive game theory, uh, where if you are playing losing games, 
to have a probability of losing, you will, you will lose. But if you, if you alternate between two losing games, you start to generate wins. One almost behaves as a kind of a traction to, to the other. Um, so, so the interplay between problems becomes important because of the potency and disposition, the latent uh, potential in those problems. Also rejecting the primacy of newness or, or the necessity of, well, for instance, now in newness, the necessity means sort of a, uh, the necessity of a digital presence of, of sensors and devices to make the stiff world dance. So, uh, you know, digital ubiquity has, by attaching itself to our notions of what is smart or intelligent, has even created a confusion about what constitutes information. Um, and that's in part why so many m media theorists are, are, you know, moving to look at uh, elemental media. But so medium design treats heavy, lumpy, physical space as an information organization uh, that's already dancing with potentials. Um, as Gregory Bateson observed, you know, a man, a tree, and an ax is an information system. Uh, and as Axel mentioned in the introduction, I'm trying to offer to all these colleagues who I mentioned before who are thinking about um, doing a kind of media medium thinking from many different disciplines, trying to offer space as one um, uh, consequential technology, uh, one huge mixing chamber for many different technologies and disciplines. And you know, while we look to digital ubiquity, while we look to the digital as the as the uh, medium of innovation, I'm I'm saying that this inclusive mixing chamber uh, might itself be an underexploited medium or technology of innovation. So smart uh, may not mean one species of information but the mixture of different species of information, like the digital together with the heavy or the spatial. Um, so beyond the newness or succession of technologies, uh, looking to the relationship between technologies. Uh, and that, that failed um, or emergent uh, set of technologies is kind of an ever-present wilderness. It, it redoubles the territory uh, uh, and material for design ecologies. One is looking for homeostasis, um, not or, or fixed pools of information, not looking for balance, but looking rather for imbalance. Um, and for extrinsic information uh, that can provide a wealth of potentials to disrupt that loop and binary. Here's another protocol of, of interplay in a completely different context in the jungles of Kenya, or this is, this is actually in the rainforests of Ecuador. Um, we already know there's a, a strong relationship between roads and erasure of the forest. You've seen these, these images. And, and while roads are typically regarded as conduits of progress and opportunity, you know, the means to deliver broadband to rural wilderness areas, they, they can also erase information imminent in cities and villages and landscapes. Again, if space itself is an information system. So this is a protocol that just considers interplay between broadband roads and forest or jungle. Um, thinking that it might be productive to dial down roads, the gray lines, when dialing up broadband. This didn't come out red on this monitor, but it's that sort of radiating circle. Um, and all that to preserve farms and forests and the kind of green information system that attracts more global resources for tourism and education that also happen to be hungry for, for broadband. So the point where, I, again, I won't go into detail, but to, just to talk about that changing a road as well as changing a bit of code can hack a telecommunications network. A heavy information. So yeah, medium design like pool um, uh, 
but the pool is interesting, you know, because it's a game surrounded by hustlers, you know, who have a, a currency and discrepancy. And medium designed really the same way to, to assess and manipulate um, the medium. It's almost as if you have to cultivate a capacity to sort of see in a split screen um, to, or dissolve the false mental partition between the nominative and the infinitive. You, you, I always say you sort of have to develop something like a canine mind um, because your dog, you know, knows words. Uh, and when you say, good girl, you know, she hears the words and knows something about what they mean in some language, in that case English. But, but a dog would never rely on those words and their assigned meaning um, outside of picking up a thousand other um, cues about the disposition of the organization, like how close you are to the dog, to the door, or the dog bowl, or whether you have a leash in your hand, or whether you um, are angry, or uh, picking up a thousand things about the disposition, uh, apart from just the sound of the words and their assigned meanings, the things we're, we're, we only know how to talk about certain kinds of things. We, we, so many, most of what we work on with our canine mind remains kind of unexpressed. Um, and in this kind of split screen, turning the sound down on declarations, maybe it's easier to detect the difference between what an organization is saying and what an organization is doing. Um, how organizations decouple their messages from their real activities and underlying dispositions. You know, on one side of the screen, stories about the socio-technical organizations that I look at is, um, you know, whether they're railroads or hydroelectric networks or blockchains, um, is always this. Um, they always talk about decentralization and freedom, always. Um, uh, but the real disposition of the organization may be concentrating power and authority with a kind of universal Ambition. I mean, here's you know the throbbing logo of Ethereum, right? Um, the universal, the elementary particle, or the smart city. You know, maintains the shine of the new to so many, even when its real organizational disposition is is centralizing information uh, in ways that violate privacy and um, concentrate authority. So even when a network is primitive and crude in disposition. It can seem new, or or uh, in an information that in a information a media social media network that purports to be information rich is filtered with a dumb binary of likes and dislikes that that erases so much of the information, or a, a global network of Dubai style zone cities that I look at. You know, facilitates not its not the free trade that it's talking about, but manipulated trade. A, a centralizing power espouses a populist message. We see that everywhere. Um, and the world's superbugs and bulletproof forms of power. They are on the one hand, you know, masters of monistic demagoguery, binary head-on brutality. Uh, you know, that's just child's play to them. Um, but they're also masters of the split screen. I mean, what, what gives them the extra bulletproof powers? Because like a confidence man, they know how lies work. Th they know that just being right is a bad idea. Uh, telling one lie is a bad idea. Telling many lies works really well. That, that starts to create a kind of Teflon um, on which... Uh, reasonable binds start to slip and slide. Uh, unburdened by truth, running rings around earnest declarations, the superbugs know how to make words dance. Um, so, so a word in some ways becomes an activity. Um, it has a lexical meaning, you know, but it, but it becomes an activity. Lies are everywhere. They're animated, they're in color, they're lubricating and insulating, and, and while um, the discrepancy that other people are trying to kind of reasonably reconcile uh, is, 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 is working for them with stunning success. 
Uh, it, it's not what the lies are saying, it's how they're bouncing, it's what they're doing. Um, uh, again, I, I have, I'm tutored by some of the best in my country, but um, so superbugs in a way come, almost become pure medium, uh, activity divorced from content or, or meaning. So consider the, uh, uh, considering kind of interplay and interdependence and failure and heavy information and discrepancy altogether, like here's a saturated story about um, automated vehicles. You've seen this kind of thing before, um, touted as the means to perfect driving, uh, reduce information, increase productivity, and so on. Um, but in this pure embrace of a new technology, uh, and you all know this, I mean, but there's a boomerang effect, of course, you know, because it, if it provides the same hands-free ride as does transit, and if it's used in lieu of transit, um, you know, imagine every seat in transit <laughs> swollen to the size of a car. Um, e even with platooning, you know, this very smart vehicle is trapped in a dumb traffic jam. So it will make more congestion than unprecedented congestion. Uh, and to relieve the boomerang effects uh, related to automated vehicles, the habitual response is, of course, it has to be a solution, and it has to be a solution from the next emergent technology like futuristic flying cars. But, it, it, but, it, but an alternative response, a kind of medium design response, would be to alter a relationship or rewire the network, even with a, a non-technical spatial variable in a spatial information system, a physical architectural volume that acts like a switch, for instance, when placed between existing transportation technologies. So a switch like an intermodal node for upshifting and downshifting into transportation um, of different capacities would probably offer a much better model, smarter model for organizing uh, maintenance, um, innovation, even, even investment, even liability in this shifting um, uh, transportation ecology. So something like designing that switch might be medium design. Um, but back to discrepancy, if you, if you really wanted to do it and reduce emissions and sprawl and all that while increasing ridership and transit and so on, wouldn't you also have to have the stomach for the spin? Um, you know, the sort of sneaky storytelling. You have to be as good as the superbugs with the kind of sneaky storytelling, the soft focus ads that portray the seduction of switching. You know, that story that would that would pry the car, uh, you know, from the cold, dead hands of Americans. So, so while bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical, it, it seems that design that has any hope of affecting change manipulates the organization as well as some kind of instrumental narrative that attends it. Um, with moves that are potentially sneakier or more politically agile, so it may be a dissonant story that, um, however non-physical, has physical consequences. It may be a narrative that makes something contagious or, or generates a message um, that renders some power more vulnerable. Or it may just have a surprising cultural bounce because of its irrationality or its outrageousness or its cuteness or its creepiness or it's violence. So all this time to be observing, in, as we have been, in a kind of canine split screen, not just the stories and lies on one side, uh, this kind of oscillation between loops and binaries, um, is maybe to observe temperament in organizations, a potential, which is not something we usually talk about in architecture, but a, a, a potential for either concentrating or distributing power, um, as well as the potential for either escalating or reducing violence. Again, the free zones I study graphically model this, this violent tendency to form loops that circulate compatible information that expel in, incompatible, inconvenient circumstances or challengers uh, like the worker, uh, labor always on the losing end, 
um, uh, and, and you know, all we have are kind of uh, uh, best practice acronyms and um, uh, bullet pointed lists and mandalas of management ease that really inoculate power against these changes. Um, again, the loop squaring off in a binary against the worker. Incredible violence. I mean, you can see the violence when this is the Rana Plaza collapse. And when, when, the, when, the, when the factory actually collapses, there is an event uh, that marks the violence. But in most of the spaces I look at, and probably many of you study, there is no event. You know, there's no uh, uh, collapse. There's no drawn sword. Um, uh, Dis disposition, a disposition to uh, imbalanced power dynamics, it doesn't happen because it's ever present as a latent temperament, just like glass doesn't have to break to be brittle. Um, so it, 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 it might be a constant aggression uh, that one is looking for. And so in this history of things that don't happen, how, what would it be like and what a, what is in the body of that text? Is it structured like an epidemiology or a branching set of thresholds and points of leverage? Um, would it be largely concerned with how to modulate violence, uh, make organizations information rich? What would be the spatio-political reagents or catalysts when there is this kind of metastasis or remission uh, in, in, in space. I always think of this moment, you know, this amazing uh, shift in temperament. Um, you remember this is the famous moment in uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1960 uh, Spartacus, uh, you know the story. Anyway, the Roman authorities gather all the slaves shackled all together in a hot field and tell them that, that if, if, the, if the insurgent Spartacus will identify himself, that he will be the only one who will be crucified. Um, and so Kirk Douglas, who Spartacus is going to stands up and is about to say, "I am Spartacus," um, when Tony Curtis, a fellow slave, stands up at the same time and says, "I am Spartacus," and then all of the slaves in the field start saying, "I am Spartacus," "I am Spartacus," "I am Spartacus." Um, it's classic medium design, um, uh, because in that and in that remission, you know, the slaves turn the tables on their captors. Um, so in this history of things that don't happen, moments like that would be more central, less mysterious or, or anecdotal. And in space, as you all know, there are countless ways to adjust the solids and liquids of the, of the urban world to reduce violence or tension. Um, Urban space has, you know, like what you call in a chess game, it has, there's material advantage, you know, there's, there are relationships in, in proximities and in uh, uh, morphologies, um, in timings, values beyond market value. Um, so in the medium, can you um, adjust both space and temperament, would it be something like a parent who comes to see their, their two kids squabbling and smacking each other? Um, you, 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 know, you do not try to parse the content of the argument with, with your two children. You don't try to find out what happened. You know, you, instead, you change, as a, you're more of a medium designer, you change the temperament of the space. You open a window. You move a chair closer into the light, you give one of them blood sugar, you introduce a pet into the hands of, the, of another, um, you're, you're altering the level of violence in, uh, uh, in, the, in the room. Um, so you know, while this global infrastructure space is perfectly uh, streamlined the global movements of, of billions of products, tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers, at a time when 65 million people in the world are displaced more than at any other time in history, as you know. Somehow there is no way 
to move X million people away from atrocities like those in Syria or facilitate movements related to climate or labor. The nation state has a dumb on-off button to grant or deny citizenship or an asylum. Um, and now the closed loop lashes out with a binary, not against the worker this time, but against the immigrant. Um, and the extra state layers of governments, the NGOcracies, offer as their best idea uh, storage in a refugee camp, a form of detention lasting on average 17 years. So the, the, the migrations uh, have been so polarizing in recent years that um, migration portrayed as a constant not as a, a, a not as a constant resource, but as a crisis. Uh, uh, those of us in the art and architecture world also know those migrating often portrayed as victims, in a way that you know allows us some self congratulation, um, uh, or they're portrayed as the, the other in a binary opposition to right wing xenophobic sentiments. Um, but what if you wanted to alter the temperament? or dispositional potential of the organization by moving away from the sharp end of the conflict or working on a remote set of switches in the larger network. Um, so countering the violence of the loop and binary, can you work on the medium to multiply something more like the one-to-one -one exchanges that have supported some of the most successful travel? I mean, if you do this, it's like I'm just asking, you know, if you do this dispositionally and temperamentally, then might you be moving from the one and the loop and the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many. I've been working on this, and I show this with you to you with some trepidation, but I've been working on an online platform called Many um, that is uh, uh, trying to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. So it refuses to regard migrating people as victims and serves those who might want to resettle, but also those who, who might want to keep traveling, you know, who never wanted the citizenship that the nation withholds or then you know, reluctantly bestows. So it's a platform that's not for everybody, um, but it's speaking for those who might say, you know, I don't really want your citizenship, um, uh, your victimhood, your structured racism or your bad jobs. Um, and it, I don't want to stay in your country. Um, so it kind of leaves the right wing to throw themselves against an open door. And it says, you know, I, instead I want a kind of cosmopolitan mobility based on a more robust networking of short-term project-based visas um, that can be aggregated for global credentials. So this platform is asking, you know, could there be a kind of global form of matchmaking between those talents and needs of migrating individuals that would otherwise be sidelined for all those many years, between those needs and multiple needs all around the world. So not perceived as haves and have nots, um, um, but more like as with Perando's paradox, the needs and problems are necessary assets in a kind of, there's a kind of um, periodic table of problems that work in a kind of chemistry. So cities can bargain with their underexploited, often failed at spaces to attract a changing influx of talent and resources. You know, um, assets that have fallen out, if you're lucky, fallen out of the financial uh, system, uh, they can maybe match their needs to the needs of mobile people to generate mutual benefits, space and time, failures and problems. Um, uh, opportunities for training in non-market exchanges. And, you know, kind of like a no-tech blockchain, there are these group-to-group -group exchanges to increase security. Um, uh, so asking, thinking about, still working on, you know, might these sorts of spatial variables have also a little bit more authority in global governance? Um, so we continue to develop that platform. Um, but the visa game is fraught and dangerous, and I don't mean in any world to present a kind of sunny one world uh, sharing app. And also since Medium Design is arguing f um, for mixtures of information systems that don't privilege the digital, it's, it's not 
the app is not the object of the design. It's just an aggregator or prompt for rearranging spatial variables in, in really a heavy information system. It's, it's low-tech, like a bulletin board or a slot machine. Um, the more heterogeneous, the more trustworthy. So, but some of the graphic conceit comes from, you know, um, spell your name with these objects by Fluxus member Jurgis Machunas, or or Paul Elliman's typographies, or or hobo code, or uh, cuneiform. Um, but I and I'm sure that you know we're still asking questions. How could it avoid the very dangers that it critiques? Um, but could these strings of journeys be anticipated and celebrated and accredited as uh, highly prized linguistic, diplomatic um, leadership credentials, um, more empowering than freedom? Um, and again, if it could do this temperamentally, could, would you be moving away from a loop and binary to a one-to-one -one and many? So f finally, you know, might might some of the world's seemingly intractable and unresponsive problems like all the superbugs and stalemates respond to something like medium design um, with the ability to detect and manipulate interplay, indeterminacy, failure, heavy information, discrepancy, latent temperament? Are, are there some techniques there for a stealthier form of activism to, to play both sides of the screen with messy, impure, non-modern mixtures of spatial change and all the gifts and pandas and rumors and meaningless distractions that are so you know, effective in culture. So on the flip side, you know, right answers are mistakes, obligations more empowering than freedom, histories following latent aggressions as well as gunshot, messy, smarter than new, you deliberately address problems with responses that shouldn't always work. And then could you steal some of the powers of this infrastructure space and design more like a snaking chain of moves to worm into and generate leverage against uh, intractable politics? And like a really good pool player, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily call your shots. You could keep them guessing. Um, it would be like being too smart to be right. Thank you. Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. And uh, we wanted to open to questions if there are any on the floor. And I think we have a second microphone also in the back with um, Jonas. If there's nobody coming forward with a question, maybe I start with um, one, because I know also that um, a lot of um, people attending today are architecture students here from the architecture school. And I wonder, because you, you spoke um, a couple of times about in-medium design as if it's um, a kind of, um, at least in your kind of uh, thinking, a kind of uh, way of designing. And um, I wonder what, how, how you imagine the role of the designer or the architect to be more specific in relationship to space, like what is actually, what is, how does uh, an architectural project look like? You, sh you showed some examples, but there were happening in graphics, like what would be, um, uh, what's the role of the designer in uh, the kind of strategy and methodology that you sketched out? Right. Um, well, I hasten to say that it, it, it um, that while I'm using this word, I don't want it to be a word, you know, a, a, there's no, it, it's not attached to anything but an, an approach that could be an approach for, and you can also see me backing away from it uh, as a name for something. Um, but 
Um, I mean, if you looked at the walls and the, I mean, basically we're just getting on with it um, in, in our studios, but working with the things we already know how to do, uh, you know, we're good at, really good at geometry and we're really good at shapes and outlines and structure and so on, and highly skilled. Um, and w why would you take away any of those skills? So it's not a zero sum game or a new camp in architecture that wants to wipe out the other. Um, you know, it's, it's more just that, that um, there's an expanded repertoire, um, that there's more things to work on. Uh, when, and students that I'm working with are very curious about that, you know, want um, a more, more power with the kinds of spaces that they're working on. Um, and so often backing out into that, um, kind of organizational strata uh, produces a lot more things to do, um, produces a lot of other reasons why a designer could be useful. Um, a lot of really just practical things, apart from the fact that um, um, some precipitates of that exercise are just ordinary things that are in uh, buildings, you know, um, uh, details, um, things like that, just maybe positioned in slightly different ways. And also, uh, um, there's, just, there's just more to do, positioned in different ways, and also uh, conceived of as part of a practice that is not a fee-for-service, um, client-based practice. So a more um, of, a, of a practice that sustains its, I mean, since practice, architectural practice now is largely unsustainable. Uh, more of a practice that sustains itself on this broader base. But if you look at me, if you've looked at the at a jury, you know, you looked at the wall, you see a lot of art. You know, you'd see skill with the things we're supposed to be skilled with, just applied more broadly. Um, maybe a site would not be a building, but would be a detail that would be multiplied over many different kinds of buildings. So still design, but um, seen differently. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, so if this medium design becomes like uh, an act of uh, terraforming, um, how how can we make sure that it, it doesn't become also a, like an act of colonialism or because I mean it, it is still a political intervention so how does one prevent the politics behind it to go bad? I, any of this could be completely ev completely evil. Um, I mean there's nothing, there's nothing about there's nothing redemptive um, about uh, expanding the repertoire that we might work with as, because I mean, you could fill it with, you know, something that's um, uh, destructive or productive. Um, I mean, I think that's a little bit what I was trying to say about the superbug and the bulletproof forms of power. They're doing that already quite well. Um, so it's as if, it, it, in their crude terms, if we don't, if we don't know how to do it, I mean, they're already really good medium designers. Um, so if we don't know how to do it, we are, and uh, forgive me for this, like, but it is a little bit like what the people in my country say, like t taking a knife to a gunfight or something like that. Um, Hi. Um, I'm, I'm a bit, going back to the first question, um, I'm a bit curious about um, your reflections around uh, Space Maker, if you know what I mean, this uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, programs that are kind oh. of, uh, uh, in a way, maximizing the role or, or the tasks that traditionally architects uh, do. Like, uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess you gathered that um, the, uh, I mean, I'm joining other people who are probably you, um, you know, who, who would 
say that this a kind of dependency on the algorithmic is not smart, um, but pretty dumb. Um, so it is not that one is, uh, or I was just to say an, an exclusive reliance on, um, but it, it seems to me that uh, it's the mixing of different species of information, whether it's um, uh, you know, a, a algorithmic or whether it's data collection along with other kinds of, of intelligence. But it, it's amazing how, um, how st like I noticed when I'm teaching at Strelka with these genius students, um, still the urge, the urge is always to purify, uh, you know, to go to one newest technology, uh, even in the smartest, smartest people. Thank you for lots of food for thought. Um, one thing I want to think more about is that you say some issues are so urgent that they have to skip the drama of being right. They need a more practical approach. And I'm thinking that the people I don't agree with political have the same feeling. Uh, that let's say migration is so urgent that the most important thing is just to do something not bothering being sure to do the right thing. So that's a quite relative uh, way of seeing things. Mm. Can you say some more about it? No, I agree with you. Um, um, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be advocating just a sort of a haphazard um, uh, a, a approach to problems, but um, with all the ways I was to describing to kind of uh, stay with problems, um, s stay with their uh, with their complications, with the information they have, rather than erasing so much of the information with a solution. Um, uh, I mean that just happens over and over and over again, and. Um, you know, it's, it, his, it, we have unbelievable amnesia for that kind of, uh, a culture has an unbelievable amnesia for that. Um, uh, so no, I mean, I didn't mean to, you know, say that one just does um, anything. At the same time, um, Maybe it is still the mess. The messier, the better. You know, um, you know that that you know in some of the interplays that I'm trying to now write about. In, you know, you, I think you may have seen this sort of very short essay called Medium Design, which was, which was. I, I'm now looking at that and seeing what a failure it was as a text. That it just was written in some kind of code where every other word is missing and um, so now I'm trying to be much more expansive on what you know what, what does that look like um, uh, engaging intelligence from a lot of different areas um, and so it really is talking about interplay uh, as not something that is authored by one you know but is that authored by many and that the main thing is just to generate interplay you know that, that that you know that that is a strengthening um, potentially strengthening agent yes. thank you for the interesting talk I'm just uh, wondering relating to the last answer because uh, in a way you're using a kind of a um, yeah a kind of disposition between the uh, different act or different actors and different what they're saying to create a messier thing and can we be like how do we ourselves interact in this mess thing is there like should we just like how, 
is is there like a way of organizing it or is that also a failure or could we interact in it in a smart way well what i was trying to suggest is that you know could could you look at organizations that that we prize because they are more information rich that simple you know uh, and that that this sort of one the one the one and only is information poor and yet we keep going for it we keep lunging for it uh, even though it is as we were saying a minute ago that it, it's the thing that often erases the very information that we need um, and I very well recognize that by saying that by using this word information to that it makes it sound like some kind of cybernetic thing that information is the elementary particle or something but and that's that's not what I mean it's that I don't have anything better um, to talk about I mean, making an organization richer or more robust, or at least it's one way of saying that, if you want to leave out the word information. Um, uh, and it's, I mean, I, it's not as if to be doing medium design would not require enormous um, research to do that little um, blue, you saw the little blue cartoon, time-lapse cartoon go by. I mean, that, that requires enormous research, um, uh, data crunching of slosh maps and uh, uh, risk analysis and all of that. Um, so still a lot of the things that people use to solve the problem, but um, putting it together with some heavier spatial variables that are that bring with them information, another kind, another species of information, you know, that isn't always quantifiable, that isn't always declarative, you know, that is more dispositional. I'm just trying to figure out how do you still survive as an architect because I find this is very convincing and it works in the framework of the School of Architecture where we have the liberty and the time to engage in those mandates and think alternative, but I'm an architect in an office and I want to make money to survive. <laughs> and if those mandates are not given to me, which they're not, there's no clients that seem to want to engage at that level. Uh, do I have to make up my own mandates? How do I uh, integrate this thinking in my job? We, we have been working on this. Uh, I'm one of people, millions of people, working on this in uh, university um, to sort of find ways to rehearse while you are in school, an, another kind of practice, um, another kind of, I call it entrepreneurial practice, but I don't necessarily mean it just commercial entrepreneurial, but social political entrepreneur, um, uh, that's not a client-based practice. Um, and mostly, um, I have started doing that now, maybe 10 years ago, um, because the situation of my students going out to work and practice is completely unsustainable, as I was saying. Um, you know, working in hierarchies, um, no money, never um, having any, you know, ability. I mean, you know the story. Um, so it's, a, it's, I thought, well, this is an opportune time to talk about the ways in which anything would be better, you know, than what is there now. Um, so, but it, it, I think it takes enormous, uh, I mean, it takes enormous uh, courage and um, resourcefulness to make it work, um, to make a practice work like that. But I'm seeing it happen. I mean, I'm seeing it happen with the people who who've, I've worked with or who are starting to change the way they um, conceive of a practice. And, forgive me, business model for that, you know, the whole, so um, I have hopes that um, w what you are doing is not necessarily a client-based practice, service practice, 
but other forms of advocacy, um, other roles um, in global governance, and so on. Um, not the architect who has to go out and get a policy degree, but the other way around, that people who make policy need to learn more about what you do. Um, that's what I'm working so hard at. Uh, I hope it will provide some dividends. Um, thank you for that talk. I actually found it really beautiful. And the poetry um, has, uh, of, of the words has, has uh, got my mind racing in a lot of the directions. And there was a name I hadn't heard for a while on reading lists, I think uh, Gregory Bateson. And I wonder if there was almost something um, spiritual in your talk, um, making room for irrational thoughts and irrational thoughts and the ways that we feel in a really um, technocratic uh, environment seems uh, like potentially useful and not wanting to um, fight the orange goblin I guess you called him um, with more the um, orange one the orange one yes. the, the orange one who shall not be named yes. <laughs> with more um, hatred and unkindness but maybe um, something more like agonism or you know. so I just wonder if you could say if, if, if that's um, happening in your thinking or or how we make room for a rationality and irrationality in this area yeah um, Gregory Basin is kind of a funny character for me because I think I look at him wrong. I take what I want from him and don't, um, because the truth is I can't really stomach the holism and the spiritualism and stuff like that that goes with him, you know, and his daughter now talking about warm data and stuff like that. You know, like I just, it's just not my style. Um, but I, and I think there was so much more I think there was so much more in his thinking than the unities he talked about. Um, um, so, so I, 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 and I'm just attracted to any kind of polymath, you know. Um, so he, he is that in every way, and somebody who thought about the architecture of groups, no matter what those groups were, whether they were like uh, dolphins or members of Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that. And for, for mo mostly here, he's useful to me because he's looking at groups and attaching ideas of temperament or tension to that. So I'm trying to look at uh, um, potentials for violence in uh, organizations that we as architects polish up into shiny s spaces that we have not, a, not really attuned to there. Their violence, but but yeah, no, I I usually add a disclaimer about about uh, Bateson and his you know as we're saying information the elementary particle and you know all of, all of that. Um, it just doesn't quite. Um, but there's much to learn from him. Okay, we get the sign that um, we maybe have reached the end of. Our event today. Thank you so much for uh, the talk, the conversation, and thank you everybody for coming and uh, good luck with uh, the rest of the day.